The Old Portrait by Hume Nisbet, first published 22nd of February 1896. Old fashioned frames are a hobby of mine. I'm always on the prowl amongst the framers and dealers in curiosities for something quaint and unique in picture frames. I don't care much for what is inside them, for being a painter, it is my fancy to get the frames first and then paint a picture which I think suits their probable history and design. In this way, I get some curious and I think also some original ideas. One day, in December, about a week before Christmas, I picked up a fine but dilapidated specimen of wood carving in a shop near Soho. The gilding had been worn nearly away and three of the corners broken off, yet, as there was one of the corners still left, I hoped to be able to repair the others from it. As for the canvas inside the frame, it was so smothered with dirt and time stains that I could only distinguish that it had been a very badly painted likeness of some sort, of some commonplace person daubed in by a poor pot-boiling painter to fill the second-hand frame which his patron may have picked up cheaply, as I had done after him. But as the frame was all right, I took the spoiled canvas along with it, thinking it might come in handy. For the next few days, my hands were full of work of one kind and another, so that it was only on Christmas Eve that I found myself at liberty to examine my purchase, which had been lying with its face to the wall since I had bought it to my studio. Having nothing to do on this night, and not in the mood to go out, I got my picture and frame from the corner, and laying them upon the table with a sponge, basin of water, and some soap, I began to wash so that I might see them better. They were in a terrible mess, and I think I used the best part of a packet of soap powder and had to change the water about a dozen times before the pattern began to show up on the frame, and the portrait within it asserted its awful crudeness, vile drawing, and intense vulgarity. It was the bloated, piggish visage of a publican, clearly with a plentiful supply of jewellery displayed, as is usual with such masterpieces, where the features are not considered of so much importance as a strict fidelity in the depicting of such articles as watch guard and seals, finger rings and breast pins. These were all there, as natural and hard as reality. The frame delighted me, and the picture satisfied me that I had not cheated the dealer with my price, and I was looking at the monstrosity as the gaslight beat full upon it and wondering how the owner could be pleased with himself as thus depicted, when something about the background attracted my attention. A slight marking underneath the thin coating, as if the portrait had been painted over some other subject. It was not much, certainly, yet enough to make me rush over to my cupboard, where I kept my spirits of wine and turpentine, with which, and a plentiful supply of rags, I began to demolish the publican ruthlessly in the vague hope that I might find something worth looking at underneath. A slow process that was, as well as a delicate one, so that it was close upon midnight before the gold cable rings and vermilion visage disappeared and another picture loomed up before me. Then, giving it the final wash over, I wiped it dry and set it in a good light on my easel while I filled and lit my pipe and then sat down to look at it. What had I liberated from that vile prison of crude paint? For I did not require to set it up to know that this bungler of the brush had covered and defiled a work as far beyond his comprehension as the clouds are from the caterpillar. The bust and head of a young woman of uncertain age, merged within a gloom of rich accessories, painted as only a master hand can paint, who is above asserting his knowledge, and who has learnt to cover his technique. It was as perfect and natural in its sombre yet quiet dignity as if it had come from the brush of Moroni. A face and neck perfectly colourless in their pallid whiteness, with the shadows so artfully managed that they could not be seen, and for this quality would have delighted the strong-minded Queen Bess. At first, as I looked, I saw in the centre of a vague darkness a dim patch of grey gloom that drifted into the shadow, and the greyness appeared to grow lighter as I sat from it and leaned back in my chair until the features stole out softly and became clear and definite, 
while the figure stood out from the background as if tangible, although, having washed it, I knew that it had been smoothly painted. An intent face, with delicate nose, well-shaped, although bloodless, lips, and eyes like dark caverns without a spark of light in them. The hair loosely about the head, and oval cheeks, massive, silky textured, jet black and lustreless, which hid the upper portion of her brow with the ears and fell in straight, indefinite waves over the left breast, leaving the right portion of the transparent neck exposed. The dress and background were symphonies of ebony, yet full of subtle colouring and masterly feeling. A dress of rich brocaded velvet with a background that represented fast receding space, wondrously suggestive and awe-inspiring. I noticed that the pallid lips were parted slightly and showed a glimpse of the upper front teeth, which added to the intent expression of the face. A short upper tip, which curled upward with the underlip full and sensuous, or rather, if colour had been in it, would have been so. It was an eerie looking face that I had resurrected on this midnight hour of Christmas Eve. In its passive pallidity, it looked as if the blood had been drained from the body and that I was gazing upon an open-eyed corpse. The frame, also, I noticed for the first time in its details, appeared to have been designed with the intention of carrying out the idea of life into death. What had before looked like scrollwork of flowers and fruit were loathsome snake-like worms twined amongst charnel house bones, which they half covered in a decorative fashion. A hideous design, in spite of its exquisite workmanship, that made me shudder and wish that I had left the cleaning to be done by daylight. I am not at all of a nervous temperament, and would have laughed had anyone told me that I was afraid. And yet, as I sat here, alone, with that portrait opposite to me in this solitary studio, away from all human contact, for none of the other studios were tenanted on this night, and the janitor had gone on his holiday. I wished that I had spent my evening in a more congenial manner, for in spite of a good fire in the stove and the brilliant gas, the intent face and those haunting eyes were exercising a strange influence upon me. I heard the clocks from the different steeples chime out the last hour of the day, one after the other, like echoes taking up the refrain and dying away in the distance. And still I sat, spellbound, looking at that weird picture, with my neglected pipe in my hand and a strange lassitude creeping over me. It was the eyes which fixed me now, with the unfathomable depth and absorbing intensity. They gave out no light, but seemed to draw my soul into them, and with it my life and strength as I lay inert before them, until overpowered, I lost consciousness and dreamt. I thought that the frame was still on the easel with the canvas, but the woman had stepped from them and was approaching me with a floating motion, leaving behind her a vault filled with coffins. Some of them shut down, whilst others lay or stood upright and open, showing the grisly contents in their decaying and stained cerements. I could only see her head and shoulders with the sombre drapery of the upper portion and the inky wealth of her hair hanging around. She was with me now, that pallid face, touching my face, and those cold, bloodless lips glued to mine with a close, lingering kiss, while the soft black hair covered me like a cloud and thrilled me through and through with a delicious thrill that, whilst it made me grow faint, intoxicated me with delight. As I breathed, she seemed to absorb it quickly into herself, giving me back nothing getting stronger as I was becoming weaker while the warmth of my contact passed into her and made her palpitate with vitality. And all at once, the horror of approaching death seized upon me. And with a frantic effort, I flung her from me and started up from my chair, dazed for a moment and uncertain where I was. Then consciousness returned and I looked around wildly. The gas was still blazing brightly while the fire burned ruddy in the stove. By the timepiece on the mantel, I could see that it was half past twelve. 
The picture and frame were still on the easel, only as I looked at them, the portrait had changed. A hectic flush was on the cheeks, while the eyes glittered with life, and the sensuous lips were red and ripe looking, with a drop of blood still upon the nether one. In a frenzy of horror, I seized my scraping knife and slashed out the vampire picture. Then, tearing the mutilated fragments, I crammed them into my stove and watched them frizzle with savage delight. I have that frame still, but I have not yet had the courage to paint a suitable subject for it. Hello and welcome to Dark History's Christmas Campfire 2021. That story was The Old Portrait by Hume Nisbet, uh, who's a uh, Scottish writer uh, from the 19th century. He wrote a lot of uh, supernatural ghost stories and horror stories. And that one, The Old Portrait, was one of his uh, just shorter numbers, uh, a shorter vampire number that I thought we could open the Christmas campfire with. But now we're going to move pretty much straight on to listeners stories strap yourself in because we've got a lot of stories this year uh, an overwhelming amount of stories in fact it's been fantastic and uh, yeah it's just been so much fun so let, let's get started shall we our first story comes from nyla and nyla wrote a lot actually several stories um we're gonna go with just one tonight and i'll save the rest for either the next episode or another Christmas campfire. But Nyla's first story revolves around uh, Queen Mary University in London, uh, the University of London. There's a rumour that the Mile End campus, particularly the Octagon building, where exams are often held, is built on an old schoolhouse. The main building is huge and boasts many rooms. Apparently, they struggle to keep security guards because there are strange happenings at night. One guard said that he would check and lock all of the rooms upstairs and no sooner did he return to the ground floor but there would be footsteps on the floor above. He also said that sometimes the piano would play without anyone being anywhere near and its notes would carry through the echoing corridors. Many people have reported hearing and or seeing a young girl crying in the Octagon building. I found out about these things after the incident that I'm about to relate. One day, in the bright sunshine, I went to visit the language centre. The language centre is in the basement and it's just a single flight of stairs, but as soon as I walked down, I found very little light and an uncharacteristic coolness. It put me on edge, but I walked on. Luckily, the language centre was not too far into the basement. It's weird because you can see the corridors beyond the centre with old furniture and massive cobwebs, as if no one goes near it. Anyway, I didn't spend long there, and when I came out and walked towards the exit, I could hear footsteps coming behind me. It sounded like someone hurrying along in high heels. You know when you can hear and feel someone behind you? The footsteps, they weren't subtle, they were loud. I remember thinking to myself, fine, if you're in such a hurry, I'll let you go past me. And I waited until the footsteps had almost caught up with me, and then I stepped to the side and looked behind me to let the woman pass except there was no one there. The footsteps, however, kept coming as loud as ever. I freaked and ran out of there as quickly as possible. As soon as I got out into the bright sunshine, I felt better. I keep trying to rationalise what it could have been, maybe someone on the floor above, and it just sounded abnormally loud. The upper floors are carpeted, though, and it was definitely high heels clicking on concrete. I can't explain it. So that's pretty much a perfect story to start with. Thank you very much, Nyla. It's uh, yeah, I I really enjoy that 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 feeling that you had there um, of when you said that you know you just you can't rationalise it and you you have a sense that something is definitely going on and it and and it and when you get that feeling, it's it can be quite unnerving. I think I remember this one time I. Something similar happened to me. I mean, it wasn't really similar to that, but it, it, it was that similar feeling where you're sure that something, you just heard something or saw something. Um, and, and no matter how you look at it, it just it didn't make sense. And it really throws you off that 
because you're, you're so used to being able to rationalize or understand something, right? Like you say, so maybe something that seems crazy at first, you, you step back and you look at it and you go, ah, oh, okay, yeah, now I, you know, I've ra you rationalize it and it all makes sense. But when you can't, that's quite an unnerving feeling and it happened to me once. It later turned out that I was being silly and actually it it, it was something much, like that I could um, like like just hand wave away. It was, I kept basically, I, I, I'll tell the story. I kept putting my phone down on a um, bedside cabinet and it kept sliding off and hitting the floor. Every time I turned away and walked away, it would slide off and hit the floor. And the bedside cabinet was flat and I don't live on a hill or anything. And, you know, the phone was shiny, but it was flat. So it was just laying flat on a flat surface. It shouldn't have been able to fall off, right? So every time I walked away and it fell on the floor, it, it the, my own, the only real kind of answer I had was, well, someone must be pushing that off. And it was quite unnerving when you look at it and you think, that's flat, that's flat. It can't move. So why is it moving? And I couldn't rationalise that. And it, that, that same feeling maybe you got with the footsteps, um, you know, it, it, it really can freak you out. Anyway, it turns out later that in my story, um, I, I'd unscrewed a computer case that earlier that day and there was a tiny little black screw that was on my bedside cabinet. And as I was placing the phone down, that little black screw was just tilting it up enough. And because obviously the phone was like shiny glass, it was just sliding off. And but you know I couldn't see that black screw because it was tiny and the bedside cabinet was dark wood and the phone was black so I couldn't see it. But man, that freaked me out until I found that screw. It really freaked me out. But it was interesting because, like I say, it did give me that experience, like you were saying there, where you just you can't rationalise it and it it can be quite unnerving. Anyway, I'm moving on because we've got listener stories, not my silly ridiculous stories. <laughs> so our, our next story comes from Beth and this one's a little bit meta um, Beth says I listen to a lot of podcasts and go through them pretty quickly at work I clean up at the end of the day and since I'm the only person in the room for an hour and a half I'll listen to podcasts I also do crafts in my garage and I listen in there as I work so I got home one night a couple months back and I wanted to do some art in the garage this is at 11.30pm and everyone else is in bed, so I go out to the garage and I put my earbuds in and I turn on Dark Histories and started to set up my canvas. The art that I do is acrylic pores and it's quite messy, so I wear gloves as I'm working. The episode that was on was the Halloween episode from last year, a poltergeist or haunting story. So as I was working, the episode was talking of the voices coming through the TV and then there was some creepy voice at that point that started like was being described. As my hands were covered in paint and I was working with the canvas, I couldn't skip ahead, so I let it run until I was done. This took a minute or two, and all the time this voice that can't quite be understood is going on. Finally, I can't take it anymore, and I pull the gloves off and start to hit the skip button and skip ahead two or three minutes, and the voice is still going. Then I drag the little dot thing ahead several minutes, and it's still there. So now I'm a little freaked out. So I drag it 10 minutes and finally it's back to normal. So I back it up to where I know that the voice was, but not all the way back. And the episode was playing as normal. So I go a little further backwards and the creepy voice is back. I start to skip ahead past where I was working. And the voice was still there. And that's when I had enough. I turned off the episode and hightailed it out of that room where I turned on all the lights and the TV. Needless to say, sleep was slow to come that night. I considered listening to the episode at work the next day, but thought better of it. That's the only episode that I've skipped. So that's the story of the Cursed Dark Histories episode. <laughs> I have to laugh during this because the whole time I feel like that's probably my fault. It's probably some editing issue or something. But, but now I say that, I'm sure other people would have complained. And, and that email is the first email I've had of someone telling me that there's anything wrong with that episode. So maybe it was just a cursed episode. Either way, again, it, it kind of plays back into that, what we were saying, like when you hear something or you see something and you just can't rationalise it, it, it's, it will really freak you out. But yeah, I, if that was my fault, I do apologise for causing you sleepless nights. <laughs> um, I hope it wasn't. But, uh, 
I, I, I'll have to go back and listen to it because I, I really li- I, well, I don't go back and listen to any old episodes. I can't bear it. But I'll have to go back and listen to that one now and, and see what comes of it. So the next story is from Bridger. Bridger says, um, I live in Montana and I'm a huge fan of the show. The Devil's Footprints was the first episode I listened to and I've been hooked ever since. I listen to it at work every day. Anyways, I've got two stories for you. They're kind of short, but feel free to use one or both or none. The first happened to my uncles. When they were boys, they lived in a small farm town in Montana called Ritchie. There wasn't much to do there, so they used the paranormal for entertainment. They used to go to an old abandoned farmhouse and try to stir things up. They never got much until one day they had an experience that ended their days of playing with the paranormal. They got their hands on a Ouija board and thought this was their chance for a real experience, so they started to ask questions. Basic stuff. Is anyone here? Can someone tell us your name? Nothing was happening. My uncles became frustrated, so they started taunting it, saying things like, you're not real, you've got no power, you can't do anything. And then, in the other room... A radio turned on at full volume. They jumped and went to see who was there. When they got into the room, the radio shut off. They looked around, but nobody was in the room. When they turned the radio on, it was at normal volume. They had no explanation outside of the paranormal. They burned the board and stopped messing with the paranormal that day. That story always fascinated me, but I've always been sceptical. One day, I had my own experience. In high school, I lived in Colorado and worked at a gym over the summers. It was an older local gym. One day I was closing and we closed at midnight. I started to close down around 11.30pm. I started with an aerobics room where we kept exercise balls. The really big bouncy ones, you know. We kept them up against the wall, so I put them all up against the wall and put away the rest of the equipment in that room. I continued cleaning up the rest of the gym and as I was walking back to lock up, I passed the aerobics room. I heard a weird noise, so I went to check it out. One of the exercise balls was in the middle of the room and bouncing. I went in and put it back against the wall but felt uneasy the entire time I was in the room. I thought maybe a vent had caused it to happen, but it wasn't really near any vents. I put it next to one to see if it could blow it and cause it to roll or bounce, but I couldn't recreate it. I didn't tell anyone at the gym because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. After all, the gym wasn't meant to be haunted and, as far as I know, nobody else had anything strange happen there. That was the last summer I worked there, though. I hope this email finds you well. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yeah, and same to you, Bridger. Um, Yeah, I... I, I, Well, I am... I I envy your bravery in that situation, (laughs) given that it was, like, midnight and that happened I would have booked it out there as fast as possible and I'm pretty sure I would have just left that room as it was I I don't think I would have been sort of partaking in any experiments to see if I could make make the balls bounce from the vents I would have just noped straight out of there I'm pretty sure so our next story is from Todd and Todd says when I was a young boy probably around 10 or 11 my family moved from the suburbs of a large metropolitan area to a 200-acre farm in a very rural area. There was an old farmhouse on the property that sat almost a mile from the road on a rough dirt path. There was farmland all around, but the house was almost completely surrounded by woods. My mother was always into gothic horror and the supernatural, which she raised me and my sisters on. Instead of regular bedtime stories, Mum would read us some scary story or passages from some gothic novel, usually a classic. So it makes sense that Santa would bring us a Ouija board for Christmas at this very young age. One night, after moving into the old farmhouse, my sisters and I brought out the Ouija board to contact any spirits that might haunt the house. We were sure there had to be something. We did contact a spirit, but the spirit did not dwell in the house. We learnt that the spirit was an early settler of the area and her family had a cabin somewhere on the property. We were told to look out for a wagon wheel. Of course, the next day my older sister and I set off to explore the acreage and find this cabin. We trekked all around, well beyond the boundaries our parents had set up. We were determined to find this spirit. We eventually found the stone foundations of a house, and right by the foundation was part of an old wagon wheel sticking in the ground. When we came back, 
We told Mum what we had discovered. Probably, as her way of scolding us, Mum told us that we shouldn't have gone looking because we might have disturbed a spirit who could come for us at night. We took this warning to heart. When we would play in the woods around the house, my little sisters and I were quick to head back into the house when it got dark because we were sure we could hear the sound of a horse-drawn wagon moving through the trees, always getting closer and closer. I was old enough to know that nothing would really happen, maybe nothing, but the sight of a ghost wagon coming for us might be a bit much for my little sisters, I reasoned. Or I was just not going to play the brave older brother. When we went into the house, we would sometimes go up to the attic to look out a little window, watching for ghostly apparitions. My older sister would stay out in the woods, waiting to see the ghost wagon until one of my parents would go out and make her come in. She would often say that the spirit of the settler would visit her in her dreams and tell stories of her life. My older sister was a terrible romantic, so most of these stories she had heard in her dreams were of lost love and terrible tragedies. She would record these stories in a journal because she thought the spirit wanted her story told. I don't remember ever seeing a ghost wagon while we lived on the farm, but I would see things moving in the woods when I looked out my window at night. What they were, who can say? Thanks very much, Todd. I would love to read your sister's journal with, uh, you know, about the the, the stories of, of the spirit. That would be, I'm sure, really interesting to read back as, as an adult. Um, you know, more so for you probably, but, you know, it would be interesting for anyone, I think. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for, for your story. Your mum also sort of reminds me of my dad when I was a kid. He was... Um, slightly crueler i think <laughs> he but he, he used to uh he used to read me ghost stories and um try and terrify me as a child <laughs> try and traumatize me um yeah i think he used to find it quite amusing um i remember once he stuck a a, a picture of the it clown um next to my bed so that i'd wake up at night and see it <laughs> yeah that's that was how i grew up um but yeah anyway um next story is from harriet <laughs> And Harriet says, I don't really ever know how to start these kind of things. I'm no author naturally, so please forgive me. Um, You're absolutely forgiven. Thanks very much for writing your story. And I promised my grandparents for ages that I'd go and stay with them near Port Lincoln. And I finally decided to go. And I took the bus from Adelaide in South Australia and arrived in nine hours and 20 minutes. They live on a large property where my granddad used to be a farmer himself. Now my uncle runs it. For a ma- as, as a matter of fact, they've lived here for 50 years. The house, as pleasant as it is, is looking rather old these days, and both my grandparents are terrible hoarders, and as well, my old granny doesn't make a big deal of cleaning it so much, which I think is understandable, because it, it's a lot. One would walk down the corridor to my bedroom and be greeted with a case of pinned exotic butterflies leaning on a cabinet on the ground, and a tall wooden altar, scented with a painting of Jesus in a blue robe holding a lamb, used as a bookshelf. There was a window at the end of the corridor, with a red stained glass window being propped up with a vase of fake flowers against it. The room I slept in used to be my auntie's, and unbelievably it has the cot I slept in when I was a baby in the corner. There were a couple of large cracks in the plaster, and twelve dead blowflies lying on their back on the windowsill. Though I spent three weeks there, I was completely unable to get used to sleeping in the house. It felt unnaturally dark all the time, and every noise one would hear occasionally felt completely out of place. And in the breezeway where the bathroom was, there was one doorway where, if the breezeway light was switched on during the night, it was as dark as anything I'd ever seen. It looked like an abyss in the shape of a doorway, and I know that it's one long corridor, which smells funny, lined with cupboards and old clocks, baby clothes and at the very end a ramshackle pile of ancient cardboard boxes i suppose i mention all of this meaningless rubbish because some ghost stories are as much about the feeling as any piece of information and maybe it means nothing without the feeling in the breezeway there are piles of boxes filled with newspapers and tea towels and all manner of other things and once a small bird got caught in behind the towers and i had to disassemble some to get it out The last point I'll make is, naturally, because I'm from the city, we lock our doors for the night, but out of the four different doors giving access to the house, 
Three didn't even have locks on them. They're country people, that's okay. It did leave me feeling quite insecure and rather vulnerable at times though. The real point begins on the 19th of November. I had promised the day before to ring my other set of grandparents. However, I was watching a documentary of my granny and left it rather late. I went out as it was getting dark to call them. I did the same thing a few days before and had a good time roaming the property while being on the phone. Admittedly, it was about five o'clock, not nine. I started to meander up the airstrip as it actually got dark. It isn't too long after you begin that you lose the sense of how long the airstrip is and how far you've walked. The airstrip is at the far end of the property, one having to walk up a slight hill past two giant sheds, a bunch of silos and another long open shed filled with farming machinery that have wheels taller than me and I'm 177 centimetres for reference. You're very isolated out there in the open. Chatting away, I reached the end and got onto the dirt road. My uncle had planted wheat on either side of the airstrip and as it was too wet to reap, it was just standing there, shivering a little in the breeze. The neighbour's house was recognisable as two huge balls of light far away from me. In my peripheral vision, I saw a big ball of light, like the lights from the neighbour's house fade into existence in the paddock I was in front of. It existed for a few seconds and then gradually disappeared. I was trying to figure out whether or not my grandparents could hear the rustling sound the wheat was making, I have to say honestly, so I only partially took it in, but I did notice it, so I stood looking down the road, waiting for it again, but it didn't appear, as I was watching. It did exactly what it did before, then I decided to linger there. I wanted to know if it would do it a third time, but it didn't. I didn't give it too much thought at first. Then it occurred to me that there was wheat grown in the paddock, and there was a small dump site made up of rusting bits of junk. Some huge things and cars, but none of that would make a light. I went back to the house rather briskly, but I didn't let it phase me. But in saying that, I was scared by a wild rabbit or something that jumped into a bush as I was walking past. A few days later, when I remembered it, I asked Granny about it, and she thought briefly and said she didn't really know and said casually, you should ask Father about that. I didn't mention it to my granddad, I forgot. All was well until about quarter past twelve on the morning of the 24th. Everything had been normal, and I was in a great mood. I was catching up on some work while playing a bit of music, and everything was perfectly quiet. There was no wind and just a perfectly silent evening. Just as the music stopped and I was mindlessly searching for something else to play, I heard this unnaturally high-pitched whimpering. I was sitting up in my bed, completely still, listening to it. My window was one of the first you'd see when approaching the house, with an array of overgrown rose bushes attached to the veranda supports. I rationally thought about the wild rabbits, the feral cats, foxes, but none really seemed to fit. Its pitch was so high it sounded like nothing I'd heard before, and it shifted between making the sounds quite regularly to pausing in between each. It wasn't far off, randomly in the distance, or just in the vicinity, but directly beside my window and out of sight. I slunk hesitantly to my window and closed the blind. In those kinds of funny situations, it's one of the last defences you feel you have. It sounds pathetic, but not long after I couldn't bear it and ached for a bit of company or support or something like that. I got up and crept to the light switch in the corridor, switched it on and stood by my grandparents' door, refusing to ask their opinion on it. I'm an adult. I suppose it was just pride. I was completely alone, with every door to the house unlocked, and every room coming off of it pitch black, trying not to look out of the window at the very end of the corridor. You wait either for it to disappear or for something unbelievable to happen. Time blurred, or whatever the saying is, but I don't know how long I stood there before wind picked up suddenly, and the whimpering morphed in a completely different sound. In no time whatsoever... It turned into old veranda pieces scraping together at the corner. I I'm not really sure. The night after, I spoke to my sister about it, but I said the noise was the veranda all along, and I didn't even think about the lights I saw a few days earlier. It was only today, after I thought about sharing my second experience, that I even remembered the first. As I'm thinking about the whole thing, I can't say anything about it really, except that maybe it was just the feeling that made it into something. 
I don't know if I would have felt the same at home. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I don't know if it makes much sense. I know the lights were real and the noise was real. However, what made them is just something all a bit weird. Thanks very much for your story, Harriet. I have to say that that would have unnerved me. And I, I live alone now and um, I routinely get unnerved by weird sounds like that. And I live in the middle of a city with locked doors. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I sleep with a with a hammer next to my bedside cabinet just in case. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, 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 I definitely would have been unnerved. At the, it's the, the unlocked doors as well. And I suppose, like you, like you mentioned, like you came from a city yourself, so having those unlocked doors was kind of heightening the experience, but it, it certainly went off for me. So the next story comes from Dom. And Dom says, This story is set at my family home, where I spent most of my teenage years and early 20s. The house had belonged to my grandfather before my father, and his son decided to move us there in 2009 because he felt as my grandfather and my grandmother did, there was no need for an elderly couple to live on a property with land that requires so much outdoor maintenance. It's a quaint cottage nestled at the end of a dusty lane atop a raised garden where it stood on an old patio and opposite only one other cottage across the lane. The home was directly surrounded by a sloped garden that rose up to the house and at the bottom of the garden, where it levelled out with the access road, there was a small flat patch of grass that my grandfather said used to be a vegetable patch that the owner before him grew his own veg on. This patch looked out onto the deep woodland that I spent many weekends playing in, even before we moved there permanently. All of this made the property the perfect family home for my father to move his two teenage sons and wife. We were and still are a family of four, my brother being the eldest out of the two of us. However, the four years between my brother and I meant that we grew up closer than how I imagine most siblings grew up. We would always be sharing stories and seldom kept things from each other. This closeness was something my parents said they made sure to instate in our personalities and it spread to how close we were to them. A close family of four who made sure to always eat together and spend evenings watching television, talking and laughing, never isolating ourselves from each other in our respective bedrooms. I noticed this was a different environment to grow up in compared to the friends I would make in school and the stories that they'd tell me. Me and my brother would often spend weekends at the house before my father decided to move us there. We'd go play in the woods, in the garden and in the village with the other children that lived there. During these days, my granddad would tell us all types of stories, as grandfathers do. Funny stories, imaginative stories and stories that almost definitely were fabricated for our enjoyment and not so commonly scary stories. One night, however, he chose to share something not quite so pleasant, and he told us of how the old man that owned the property before him passed away on the vegetable patch at the bottom of the garden whilst picking whatever he had been growing there. This didn't initially scare my brother and I too much, however it was something I never forgot in the years leading up to us moving there. Years later, we moved in and, amongst all the fun we used to have, a fair share of strange happenings would occur over the years. One of the first I can recall is a story my brother had talked about. One summer evening, he was in the woods, tending to the small collection of chickens my mother had insisted upon having, for the eggs and cooking purposes, I would imagine. Above the chicken pen, slightly raised so it looked down over it, stood an old shed. It harboured nothing but wood, piles of dirt, and the odd tool my grandfather would have left in there, nothing too valuable or sought after, as the shed didn't have a door. It barely had any sides. He was down there completely alone, not afraid, of course, being an 18-year-old, outdoorsy character. He was far from out of his comfort zone. That was until something made him look up to the shed, and just as he did this, a stick, looking as if it had been thrown by a human, flipping through the air was travelling straight for his head. His quick-witted reactions meant that he dodged the stick. Initially thinking it was either my father or me that had thrown it, he carried on doing whatever he was doing, mumbling to himself things like, better luck next time, N nice try, etc. All the while, keeping one eye on the shed. But no one came out. He walked up past the chicken pen to go and investigate whether someone was in, behind or anywhere near the shed. 
but discovered no one. Upon entering the house, he frantically tried to squeeze it out of either me or my father that we must have played a practical joke and somehow sneaked back into the house before him. This, however, was not true, and it certainly wouldn't have been my mother. I thought for many years that this was purely a misunderstanding, and that maybe a trick of the light and a falling branch had convinced my brother that a stick was thrown at him. But further happenings over the years have swayed me into believing him after all. The lounge at the side of the house looked out onto the patio and then down to the garden. The lounge was effectively the snug room where, as a family, we would spend most of our evenings. There was a log burner in the centre of the exterior wall and a window on either side. For our comfort, two big sofas positioned so we were facing the log burner and subsequently the windows. In the first few years of living there, I would always notice what looked like a fully grown man past the furthest bright window. The first few times I would notice it, I would be so sure it was someone I would expect the back door to go, but it never did. As the years went on, I made a point of mentioning this to my parents and brother one evening, and they looked at me shocked. Not the type of shocks where they didn't believe me or that they didn't like what I was saying, more so as if they'd been keeping something from me. They went on to say that they had all noticed it, but with me being the youngest, they were hoping to keep me naive and ignorant to something everyone was noticing. Time passed and the shadow, or whatever it was, would be seen by all of us, not so often to the point where it would become normal, but often enough to the point where we would call it the man in the window. You could almost predict it happening, as you began to look up, feeling almost as if something was making you look up, you would know you were about to see something and sure as can be, there it was, a white figure floating past, slowly enough that you could see it, but just fast enough so that you couldn't make out anything other than a shape. As we settled into our new home, we would have more and more visitors, friends and family would come over and whenever they spent long enough in the lounge, they'd often say things like, oh, someone is here and who was that and... Oh, someone just walked past the window, to the point where, after many years, frequent visitors, uncles and aunties, cousins, grandparents and friends would all be totally on board with the man in the window, whether it scared them or not. After a few years of living there, it was high time for the introduction of a family pet, with plenty of garden space and further land to be roamed, a border collie dog seemed quite the candidate and we were all pleasantly surprised at how much joy Stitch brought to our lives. A free-spirited, outdoor dog that lived on the side of the annex in the front garden. The night time was always peaceful and quiet, with the lack of passing traffic and the position of the village in relation to big roads on a still evening meant that you could hear any goings-on in the surrounding garden or woodland. A fox bark, a noise that would make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, would often be heard if your window was open at night which, for my family, seemed to be most of the time. Even the winter months wouldn't stop us from cracking the window before we got into bed, as the log burner provided more than enough heat to keep the small cottage warm. This leads me on to the next strange happening of the house that really is quite unexplainable. The patio surrounding the house was old, and because of this it had begun to follow the earth's contortion, becoming distorted and uneven. This, of course, meant that several slabs would rock when stood on and make a very distinct noise. One slab that was at the top of the steps leading up to the house was frequently stood on and so became the signature noise that would notify us of someone arriving back home or visitors arriving. You couldn't avoid standing on the slab and as a frequent visitor or someone that lived at the house, you got used to standing on it and hearing it clunk back down as you carry on past it. To make it rock enough so that it would make the noise, however, it had to be someone with weight to them. For instance, Stitch would wander around all day and he never had the weight to make the slab rock or slam back down. It is then very odd and intriguing to be lying there in bed. It could be early in the morning or late at night and once or twice it even woke me up when the slab would go clunk. My parents' room was right above the top of the steps. They would also hear this at the most peculiar of times in the night. They had the beauty of being able to poke their heads out of the open window, only to see nothing. The dog curled up asleep in his bed, not a movement to be seen. 
The final notable and reoccurring weirdness that would happen in and around our family home is what we all agreed to be the most strange indeed. To access the house from the top of the steps, you would have to first enter a conservatory, then through the double doors, you would enter the kitchen diner area. If you would walk through the kitchen and through another door, you'd enter the lounge and the stairs. Throughout the winter, the doors from the kitchen and diner area to the conservatory would be kept shut to keep the cold conservatory from infecting the warm air that the log burner had created. In the summer, however, you'd simply pull the door too. The temperature in the conservatory was quite like that of the rest of the downstairs during the hotter months. This meant the door was susceptible to movement throughout the summer, as in the winter, the door was shut. In the summer, whenever the outside door into the conservatory would be opened, there would be a vacuum created, causing the door in the kitchen to pop open. From inside the lounge, you'd hear this, followed by the outside door shutting too. This again is another signal to tell you someone has walked in the house. What follows of this story can be strongly backed up by each one of my family members, no matter how fantastical it may seem. On one occasion only, when each one of us would be alone in the house and sitting in the lounge on a summer's day, the door from the conservatory to the kitchen would pop open. Following this, was the bang of the door from outside shutting. As you would expect to greet someone, you would get up and poke your head into the kitchen but on every occasion for all four of us, there was no one else around, no one even home. This was in the middle of the day, when the door to the kitchen was pulled to, and the conservatory door was shut on every occasion. Speaking from personal experience, I'd never feel scared during any of the events. I also think, back now, since I've moved out and it isn't a place that I find daunting or scary, I'd feel perfectly happy sitting in the lounge of an evening and seeing the man in the window, spending an evening in bed to be awoken by a slab rocking when nobody walked over it, and watching TV on a hot day when I should be outside recapturing my youth to hear the door go and nobody come in the house. There are, of course, technical explanations for each of these happenings. I've discovered many, however, something deep down tells me some things don't need explaining. They just need sharing. I couldn't agree more, Dom. Thanks very much for sharing it. It's a great bunch of stories from a house that I think must have been fantastic to grow up in. Um, quite amazing that you feel so chilled out about a shadow that would walk past the window, though. I'm not sure I'd be so relaxed, even even at my ripe old age. But yeah, thank you very much for sharing. And, and like I say, um, I, I'm sure a really fun house to grow up in, actually. Um, yeah, our next story... It's from Mary, and Mary's story goes like this. In 1987, I came to Britain for the first time. I travelled from California, where I was at university, to see my English boyfriend, whom I'd met in the Caribbean at Marine Field Station the year before. After a few days in London, we drove north in his little Renault 5. Being the adventurous sort, he had booked a cottage on an uninhabited island off the west coast of Scotland for a holiday. We set off from the Isle of Sale on the main boat with enough provisions for ten days, even though we'd only booked for a week. It was mid-December and the likelihood that the boat wouldn't be able to get out to pick us up on the agreed date was quite high as the weather that time of year is unpredictable. The sea was surprisingly calm as we approached the islands, called the Garvelax, which were rugged and mostly ringed by cliffs. We were dropped off onto a little jetty onto Garvelax, the largest of the small string of islands. Before he departed, the captain showed us how to use a flare gun. This being the 1980s, the flare gun was the only way that we could communicate with the outside world if there was an emergency. The island was covered in grass and woodland. In Scotland, of course, there was also sheep and history. The islands had been the site of the 4th century monastery founded by St Brendan, and also probably the site of the castle of Duncanale, which had been granted to one of the Highland Lords by the King of Norway in the middle of the 13th century. Our home for the week was an old and basic traditional crofting cottage, presumably forcibly abandoned during the Highland clearances in the 19th century. It stood on the shore of a small bay with a cobbled beach. It had no electricity, but there was propane gas for cooking in the rough kitchen and a wood-burning stove in the living room. There was a bedroom upstairs, 
but we ended up dragging the very old mattress downstairs so that we could position it in front of the fire, it being winter and freezing cold. Behind the cottage, there was a tumbled-down cemetery, but this didn't bother us in the slightest, being rational scientists. This may not sound like everyone's cup of tea, but the islands were stunning, and the night sky was awesome. Also, we were young and madly in love, so there seemed little downside to having only four hours of daylight and plenty of time to spend snuggling in front of the fire. My boyfriend spent hours sourcing firewood, and I baked bread, and we watched wildlife, including stalking a herd of red deer, and made friends with a little shrew that lived in the kitchen. As I mentioned before, it was cold and the nights very long. On one of the last mornings of our stay, we were having breakfast when my boyfriend said that he had something to tell me, but to remind him after we got off the island, as he didn't want to talk about it just then. Intrigued but not concerned, I didn't really give it much thought. We were having such a good time that we were actually disappointed when the mail boat was able to pick us up. Once back on dry land, I asked my boyfriend what it was that he'd be going to tell me, and he said that he'd been asleep, facing away from me, and I had lain my hand on his shoulder. It was icy cold, and he thought that he'd better put another log on the fire. When he sat up, he realised that I was facing away from him, and that the cold hand on his shoulder couldn't have been mine. Fast forward 33 years, and we're on another less austere holiday on Scotland's west coast in 2020. My boyfriend has been my husband for 31 years. On a particularly gorgeous September day, we went on a small boat tour to see the Corrie Wrecken Whirlpool and watch wildlife. We could see the Garvalax in the distance, and I could just make out what I thought was the little cottage through the binoculars. My husband was telling the first mate about how we'd stayed in that cottage on Garbilac in the 80s, He was confused and said there is no cottage on the Garvalax. We spoke to the old captain and it transpired that the little croft fell into disrepair soon after we stayed there and it's been derelict for decades. The icy cold hand on my husband's shoulder that freezing December night is the only time he's experienced anything like that. It's fitting that his only ghostly encounter happened in such a mystical, history-soaked remote place which now is just a ruin. Thank you very much for your story, Mary. That sounds like an awesome holiday. You said it doesn't sound like everyone's cup of tea, but it certainly sounds like mine. What a great holiday. Just going out to an uninhabited island and staying in a near derelict cottage surrounded by wildlife. It sounds amazing. Um, and also, thank goodness that your now husband then boyfriend didn't tell you that story whilst you were on the island because I, if that had been me, I don't think I would have thanked him very much. And also congratulations to 31 years of marriage and, you know, to have such a great story um, for, for, between you guys. That sounds like a, a fantastic life, I guess, and relationship. So, yeah, congratulations. So our next story will be the last one for tonight. I'm going to split this episode up into two because we're just about, well, barely halfway through. So I'm going to split them up and then that way we've all got something to look forward to between Christmas and New Year. So this next story and the last one for tonight is from Gisela. And Gisela says, I have a couple of weird events that happened to me at the same house. During the late 80s, I was an art student and made friends with a girl on the same course as me called Jo. She'd lived in a nearby market town in a large and somewhat dilapidated manor house with her parents, who were both academics, and her three brothers. Her parents had bought the house for a song years before because of its condition, and had done some half-hearted restoration here and there, but mostly it was falling to pieces with parts of the house, especially many of the bedrooms never really used. It had an entrance hall with a grand staircase, and my friend's bedroom was the first room on the right when you went up this. There was also a smaller wooden staircase at the back of the house, presumably for servants, which was in the corridor that had the kitchen and pantry off of it. For some reason, two of her brothers had their bedrooms at the back of the house, away from everyone else, and they used that staircase as it was more convenient for them. There used to be some cool pubs in the market town, so it quickly became a thing for a group of us from college to go over for a pub crawl. As I lived too far away to go home afterwards, I got invited to stay the night with Joe, crashing on her bedroom floor. After a couple of visits, 
it was quickly clear that I used to wake up way before her, like hours before. So she told me to go down and make myself a drink or, or breakfast or whatever I wanted and le basically leave her to go to sleep. Mostly her mum or one or more of her brothers would be in the kitchen with the radio blaring and the kettle just boiled, so I soon got comfortable going down without her. I always used to go down the main staircase, which was a slightly longer route to the kitchen, but as I wasn't familiar with the layout of the upstairs of the house, I stuck with what I knew. Going that way, you had to go through one of those solid bay doors from the main house to reach the kitchen corridor. One morning, I went down and, for once, no one else was up yet and the kitchen completely silent. I propped open the kitchen door, as it usually was in the daytime, and stuck the kettle on. I was just making a cup of tea when I heard firm footsteps cross the landing above and start to come down the stairs, neither of which were carpeted. Assuming it was one of Joe's brothers, I propped my head out into the corridor and said, The kettle's just boiled. Do you want tea or coffee? Only there was no one there. In the moments it took my brain to compute that there was actually no person in sight, the footsteps continued down the last couple of stairs and passed right in front of me along the corridor to the bay door. As you can imagine, I about crapped myself and dived back into the kitchen slamming the door. The flight instinct was strong, but it would mean going out into the corridor. In the end, I braved it and bolted out of the kitchen through the bay door and up to Joe's bedroom, where I pretty much physically picked her up out of the bed to shake her awake and babble about the footsteps. Her response was a bemused, Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't tell you about that. You can imagine my reply. Sometime the next year, I was staying the weekend again, sleeping on the floor in Joe's room. Sadly, things were very different by now. Her parents' marriage had disintegrated, though they had decided that they would stay together until the children were older, which, frankly, is never a good idea when you can't even be in the same room as each other. There were bitter arguments, vicious snipping and a really strained and unhappy atmosphere. Jo had asked me over to keep her company as she was pretty low and if we weren't out, we were holed up in her room. We were both untidy teenagers at the best of times, so by the Sunday, it was a bit of a pit. It had got really cold that day and there was no heating upstairs, so we were downstairs sitting around the open fire with our brothers listening to music. We had closed the door to Jo's room on our way down. At one point, late afternoon, I got up to go to the toilet. There was only one working one, which was upstairs at the end of the same corridor Joe's bedroom was on. As I went past her room, I noticed the door was ajar and the light was on, so I stopped and looked in. I could see a figure in the middle of the room. They were bent over, as if they were rummaging or sorting through something. I assumed it was Joe's mum, and was mortified that she was there cleaning up after me, so I stepped into the room saying, That's my bag, it's okay, I'll tidy it. As I did so, the figure just vanished before my eyes. I'll confess I decided to go home that night instead of staying over again. I did tell Joe why the next week, and she said as things had got more strained in the house that they had had more and more weird occurrences, lights switching themselves on and off, doors opening and closing, and things disappearing. Her mum had also seen a figure upstairs that had disappeared when she approached it as well. A few months later, her parents did decide to split and the house was put on the market. It's now a nursing home. One final incident that's always stayed with me. I'd gone into Oxford to meet a friend before going to the pub to meet a group of other friends. We'd just walked into the entrance vestibule of the pub when another girl we knew walked out of the ladies and we greeted each other and paused to exchange some news. To the right was a door through to the bar and to the left was one to the toilets and behind us, a staircase which led to the floor below. Our friend was just asking us if we'd heard the news about a girl who used to come to the same pub who had been attacked, when this really nasty, gloating male voice said loudly behind us, she deserved it. All three of us spun around, outraged to confront whoever it was that had said it, but there was no one there. The staircase was empty, and the door at the bottom of it was shut. As you can imagine, we were all pretty freaked out. Yeah, absolutely. I can, imagine, I can imagine being freaked out through all of those stories. Um, although I have to be said, like, when I was reading your story about your friend Joe's house, it's one of them situations where you think, oh gosh, I, I wish that was me because I'd love to stay there more. When in fact, you know that if it was you, 
I wouldn't have stayed there more. <laughs> I would have booked it out of there as soon as I could. <laughs> but in your mind, you like to think that you'd be brave enough to go and stay there more and, you know, see, uh, yeah, experience more. But yeah, probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't at all. Anyway, thank you very much for all your stories. Say so we're going to call it a day there. Uh, the next group of stories is going to come out sometime between Christmas and New Year. It really depends when I have the time to put it out. Um, not so much to do it and put it out. Um, it, it's more just I've got to be around to press that button. And I'm not sure when, what days I'm seeing my parents yet or, or going back to see my family and stuff. So, um, yeah, sometime between Christmas and New Year, probably around the 27th or the 28th, I will um, get the next christmas campfire out and that that will be the, the the remainder of the stories so yeah i hope you enjoyed this one best wishes to you and your family on christmas i hope you have a fantastic time uh, stay healthy um if you're not healthy at the moment like a lot of people in england uh get well soon i guess and and uh yeah have a safe and swift recovery it's been a another fantastic year and uh yeah, this uh, this has been a, a brilliant way to top that off. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. I'll stop rambling. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays. Um, yeah, thanks very much.